just to give some thought to one of the things that you're here. And I'll bring it up to that crane for because one of the grandkids uh, has, they don't know what it is, whether it's migraines or what, but the, they've done all, they're going on such a test. And I think that's neat. They're not afraid to talk to someone. Yeah, and let you know about that. I mean, you got to know them that well. It, they opened up to you. That's great. Name's Dylan. Mm. They're working on tests. Yeah. And I think it's fun. Well, that's what we want. Yeah. That's what the Lord wants us to do is uh, reach multiple generations. All right. Well, welcome, everyone, to the Minor Prophets. We've, we've really, you've gotten through quite a bit of books of the Bible. And if you consider that there are 66 books in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Scriptures, or actually, no, 39, 39 books in the Hebrew Scriptures, 27 in the New Testament, 66 total, covering 12 out of 66 books is pretty good, you know, in a 10 or 12 week period. So you've covered, you know, a good amount of content, even if it's not the longest books of the Bible, you've got an idea of a major section, to be honest, um, the 12. So uh, that's, that is true. It teaches us not to overlook the little ones. I'm guessing the Psalms. Yeah, Psalms is 150 chapters. Some In some versions, it's 151 in the Orthodox, um, Eastern Orthodox, because the Greek version of the Hebrew scriptures called the Septuagint has um, an extra psalm in there. So, which, and then there's some, yeah, both the Orthodox and the Catholic include something called the Apocrypha. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard of the Apocrypha? Mm -hmm. Yeah are also known as the deutero deuterocanonical writings, secondary to the canon. That's what it means, literally. And they are found in Aramaic and Greek, but not in a Hebrew form. So they are also part of that Septuagint, the scrolls in the Septuagint. And <clears throat> they tell of the inter, you know, the intertestamental inter period, that um, period we talk about as the famine of the word. There's some part, there's another chapter in Daniel. Um, and then there's this, the, the story of uh, the, Maca the Maccabi or the Mac Maccabees. Uh, that's particularly notable because it's about, it connects to the holiday of Hanukkah, which you've heard of the festival of lights. And um, that, uh, that period where uh, the Greeks actually ruled the area of you know, Judea, and they and that was a, as a small group, the Maccabees took back um, Judea and Jerusalem, and established the Hasm what they called the Hasmonean dynasty. And Herod claimed, you know, succession in the Hasmonean dynasty, even though it had by then become a vassal client state of Rome. Um, but once Herod the Great died, it was divided between. Four, four sons, and it became what's known as a tetrarchy. And then actually it was three sons, but the fourth part of that tetrarchy was a Roman governor. Mm -hmm. And then the Roman governor we know is Pontius Pilate. And so all these little princes were basically just Roman intermediaries. Um, so, yeah, so interesting parts of the, you know, you could do a whole course on understanding the different genres, composition of the Bible, you know, it, it's an amazing book with a uh, lot to take a look at and learn. Um, but like I said, we've covered quite a bit if we think about it. Um, so we're going to go to Bakuk. Before I do that, let me go ahead and open us to the word of prayer. Lord God, I give you thanks and praise uh, for this opportunity to study your word. Um, Lord, to listen to your prophets. Uh, speak truths into our lives, to challenge us, to comfort us. And Lord, we just pray that you would open our hearts and minds and illumine our lives and connect us together in this fellowship of believers. I pray this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.
<laughs> Habakkuk. Habakkuk or Habakkuk. Habakkuk. Okay. Yeah. I've heard it as both, but some people in seminary corrected me when I said Habakkuk, they say Habakkuk. I was like, all right, I'll go with that. Habakkuk. So somewhere else and I'll say like or Amos or Amos or yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. So we are um, in Habakkuk chapter one. This is the oracle that the prophet Habakkuk saw. O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not listen or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see wrongdoing and look at trouble? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arrive. So the law becomes slack. And justice never prevails. The wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, judgment comes forth perverted. This is similar to a lament. This is a lament. Um, the prophetic act, you know, mourning the state of the world as it is. Uh, sounds familiar. Sounds familiar. In this present age, it would it would be a lament that we could share. You know. This is the sixth, uh, late sixth century, or the, um, yeah, early sixth century, about 597 BC, just before the Babylonian conquest of um, Jerusalem and the exile. It uh, speaks to that they were already beginning to have skirmishes and conflicts with the Ch Chaldeans. The Assyrian Empire had come to an end by this time, and around towns around Jerusalem were beginning to be conquered. And usually that's how it would often happen. We, we tend to think of a country having a big contiguous border, but really most of the time states in the ancient world were a collection of city-states. And so certain villages and you know a part of the kingdom of Judah had already been taken over by the Chaldeans. Jerusalem was next, but Jerusalem's a fortified town. It took many more, you know, several more decades before that was finally taken over in 586, 587, depending on your dating. Um, this is similar to, well, we're, I'm getting ready to go to, I've been learning a lot about the history of Constantinople, Istanbul. You know, it, <clears throat> it was, you know, about, even about 900 or 1,000, the Byzantine Empire had begun to crumble. And then, you know, different city states had been taken over as parts of different caliphates and the Seljuk Turks. But it wasn't until, you know, the 1300s or finally in 14 something, I don't remember the exact date, but that uh, Byzantium finally fell with Istanbul, Constantinople being the last city. It was had a lot of, fort, you know, had was well fortified. But can you imagine a whole vast empire shrinking to one city-state? So Jerusalem is kind of at this point, and they know, well, it's precarious. They've seen most of the kingdom has been conquered by this time. Um, you know, when we, when we it, I think it gives us permission to ask these difficult questions of God. I think when you see this prophetic act, it's not a, a divine declaration. This is a lament before God, but it should give us permission to offer that lament to God. And then it's almost as if there's a call and response in the prophecy, because in the beginning in verse five, you can see that this is a this is the voice of God speaking in return. Look at the nations and see, be astonished, be astounded, for a work is being done in your days that you would not believe if you were told, for I am rousing the Chaldeans, 
that fierce and impetuous nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. Dread and fearsome are they, their justice and dignity proceed from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards, more menacing than wolves of dust. Their horses charge. Their horsemen come from far away. They fly like an eagle swift to devour. They all come for violence while faces pressing forward. They gather captives like sand. At kings they scoff. And of rulers they make sport. They laugh at every fortress and heap up earth to take it. Then they sweep by like the wind. They transgress and become guilty. Their own might is their God. <clears throat> And then once again, kind of the voice of the prophet in response in his own monologue. Are you not from of old, O Lord, my God, my holy one, you shall not die. O Lord, you have marked them for judgment and you, O rock, have established them for punishment. Your eyes are too pure to behold evil and you cannot look on wrongdoing. Why do you look on the treacherous and are silent when the wicked swallow those more righteous than they? You have made people like fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. <clears throat> yeah, and then once again, another question. Um, why aren't, when are you going to do something about this, God? When are you going to do something about this? Why aren't you doing something about this? And then the response is, is that there's some other nefarious force. In verse 15, the enemy brings all of them up with a hook. He drags them out with his net. He gathers them in his sign. So he rejoices and exults. Therefore, he sacrifices to his net and makes offerings to his sign. Uh, for by them, his portion is lavish and his food is rich. Is he then to keep on emptying his net and destroying nations without mercy? I spell the word sign. Yeah, I got my translation. Um, sane, yes. sane, sane, yeah. Sane, yeah, that's what it is. Yep. And it's something that can still be caught again. Yeah, a fishing net which hangs vertically in the water, which floats at the top. And ways at the bottom edge, the edge being drawn together to encircle the fish. So yeah, it's so we continue. We don't. We think all that's going to be the same. Yeah. Send. Yeah. Send. So it says pronunciation. Send. Send. Yeah. All right. Send. So it's um, the image of the net, um, the enemy, you know, whether it be the Chaldeans or some more uh, deeper cosmological enemy. Uh, you know, the enemy, the enemy is something that we don't get a lot of hint about. You know, we're, I mean, of course, we're not in the business of trying to study the enemy, you know. Uh, it's God's responsibility to know and to know how to defend us, to protect us. But the enemy does operate, we know, you know, and there are ways that we can protect ourselves. Um, but that being said, there are ways in a fallen world that, you know, the devil, the enemy operates, rules, reigns, and reign, uh, works through people. And sometimes people do the evil without the enemy, even necessarily to interfere, you know. So the question is, is, well, how much credit or no credit do you give the enemy, the devil? Um, yeah. And then to add, the, add to the complication of it all, the prophets acknowledge that sometimes the bad things that happen are the, judge, are the judgment of God or that God has allowed this to happen. I don't know that they ever answer all the questions 100% about what is what. Um, I think when you see Habakkuk reflecting, he's reflecting all of these scenarios and possibilities and trying to make sense of it, just like you and I. And then, um, you know, 
then the boy, the divine voice that kind of comes through the prophecy is saying that, you know, there's an acknowledgement. Nope, these are, this is God's will and this is God's judgment. You know, do you think it's fair? No, I don't, you know, or whatever it may be. But we have to acknowledge that in the mystery of it, there are some things that we're not going to agree with on the surface that are part of God's will. But God knows better than we do. Um, Actions have consequences. Yes. I will stand at my watch post and station myself on the rampart. I will keep watch to see what he will say to me and what he will answer concerning my complaint. Then the Lord answered me and said, write the vision, make it plain on tablets so that a runner may read it. For there is still a vision for the appointed time. It speaks of the end. It does not lie. If it seems to tarry, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Look at the proud. Their spirit is not right in them, but the righteous live by their faith. Moreover, wealth is treacherous. The arrogant do not endure. They open their throats wide as shield, like death, they never have enough. They gather all nations for themselves and collect all peoples as their own. Now, here's the reply, the divine reply to the prophet's complaints. Here's the, you know, the God's explanation of what we see. In theology, this is known as theodicy. You know, the way do you, how do you reconcile a good God and gracious God with uh, evil and injustice in the world? Why do bad things happen to good people or why do good things happen to bad people? And I think that's the bigger answer to the question is why do good things happen to bad people and why do they seem to win? And the Lord is saying that this is temporary. It's ephemeral. You think it's on the surface you may think that they're winning. You may think that they're gaining, but it, when in fact they're chasing an elusive goal, you know, they may get us to a certain point, uh, but it all rolls back down on them. Um, in the Greek mythology, there's an image of a, in the underworld of a man named Sisyphus. Uh, Sisyphus, I don't know the whole myth of Sisyphus. I've forgotten my Greek mythology. But anyhow, I remember enough about Sisyphus to know that he was punished because of what he had done in his life to have to roll a boulder up a hill to a certain point. And at a certain point, he was able to get to it and then it would roll back down. Then he'd have to keep doing it again. So for an eternity, he's trying to roll a boulder up a hill and it goes up one way. He thinks he makes progress and it comes back down. And I, I think that that Sisyphean uh, sort of image of kingdoms conquering and coming and rising on the scene is that boulder rolling up a hill. You think that you're going to establish an empire and you're going to do it through an unjust means, but it will roll back down on you. It will not last. And that's what God is saying is that, yes, you may see that they're gaining in the short term, but in the long term, they will not. And we look back at history and we realize that the Assyrians were on the scene quite a bit longer than the Chaldeans, than the, the Babylonians. You know, child, Assyrian, height of the Assyrian Empire lasts four to 500 years, about 1300 to 800, comes to a conclude, close at the time that there is, you know, the Chaldeans, Babylonians have ascended. But the ba Babylonians only rule for a period of about, um, you know, 70 to 80 years. And then they collapse as well. And then the Greeks, and then they collapse. Or, or no, not the Greek, the, the Persians. And then the Persians collapse, and then it's the Greeks, and the Greeks kind of become merged into the Romans, and on and on and on. And so we literally look at history, and it and it proves the divine, uh, the divine answer to our question. Why do these guys seem to, to win, and they do good? Well, they, you know, Really, what the answer is, is you um, you try to chase these things in the short term, you can look like you're you make big, great results. But in the long term, it would mean it will collapse. Um, it's kind of like a. Uh, a man, new manager comes to a organization and starts to cut corners or let's say somebody comes in and says, you know what, we're going to cut costs and we're going to 
and they slash costs so much so that in one or two quarters, it looks like they're a genius and the profits have gone way up only for at this, you know, as time goes on for the, you know, there to be deferred maintenance and then customers don't want to come to your store. I mean, this is kind of what happened to Sears, so to speak, you know, Eddie Lampert thought he was, you know, he was a hedge fund manager. He comes to Sears. People think, oh, he's going to merge Sears and Kmart. This is great. It's a genius. And there was profits for a couple quarters. And then on and on, it, you can't just cut everything and make it a horrible customer experience and get people to buy from your store. So eventually, after 15 years, a huge, massive corporation just comes to next to nothing um, because of uh, short, you know, the pursuit of short term gain. And that's the that's the fight for empire. So you can either fight for personal gain and for empire in this world, or you can be on the side of God's kingdom, which endures. Yeah, so I think that's the divine answer to our to our question, the questions of you know things that are going on in in Hamas, in Israel. There will be peace one day in the Middle East. The questions about you know. It, um, it, Russia and Ukraine and what's going to happen there. It will get resolved. It will in time. You know, the wicked will not prosper in the long run. <clears throat> so let's uh, continue with uh, the woes of the wicked. Shall not everyone taunt such people and with mocking riddles say about them, alas for you who heap up what is not your own. How long will you load yourselves with goods taken and pledged? Will not your own creditors suddenly rise and those who make you tremble wake up? Then you will be booty for them because you have plundered many nations. All that survive of the people shall plunder you because of human bloodshed and violence to the earth, to the cities and all who live in them. Alas, for you who get evil gain for your houses, setting your nests on high, to be safe from the reach of harm. You have devised shame for your house by cutting off many peoples. You have forfeited your life. The very stones will cry out from the wall, and the plaster will respond from the woodwork. Alas for you who build a town by bloodshed and found a city on iniquity. Is it not from the Lord of hosts that people labor only to feed the flames, and nations weary themselves for nothing? But the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. Alas for you who make your neighbors drink, pouring out your wrath until they are drunk, in order to gaze on their nakedness. You will be sated with contempt instead of glory. Drink you yourself and stagger. The cup in the Lord's right hand will come around to you, and shame will come upon your glory. For the violence done to Lebanon will overwhelm you. The destruction of the animals will terrify you because of human bloodshed and violence to the earth, to the cities and all who live in them. All right, let's kind of bring Habakkuk to a close here because it will get repetitive. Um, we've, you know, you hear a lot of the judgment of the Chaldeans. Um, and then in verse 17, it suddenly shifts at the, um, at the end. Um, you know, just before that, um, actually beginning in um, verse 7, and then it finally it ends in verse 17. Let's read. I'm going to read 17 to 19 in uh, chapter 3 here as we close it out. Though the fig tree does not blossom and no fruit is on its vines, though the produce of the olive fails and the fields yield no food, though the flock is cut off from the fold and there is no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will exult in the God of my salvation. God. The Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer and makes me tread upon the heights. And then it concludes with a note of uh, on this on this song, because some part of this prophecy is a song, kind of like a song. There's a part that's a lament and there's a part that exalts the Lord to the leader with string instruments. So some of the prophets would sing this, uh, if you can imagine that. Um, I, I think that what you see here is an act of mature faith. First and foremost, Vaka questions God. 
seeks God for a response. God provides a response. He thinks about it and incorporates it. And even in the midst of suffering, he finds a way to give praise to God. And that um, is a sign of a, a mature faith, a deepened faith that even in the midst of hardship, you can find a way to praise God. Because you, you realize that God is playing the long game. And then when you, when you are on the side of God, you're on the side of eternity. And time is on your side. Unlike if you're on the time of, you know, empire, time is not on your side, you know. Yeah. So I think that it's a good, it's a message that we certainly, as you indicate, Linda, we need to hear in this day and age. You know, how do we, you know, wait upon the Lord? Go to. It's hard though when you're the one waiting and you're not no. it, and you're not and you might not ever see it. Yourself. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. I mean, there's people who waited for um freedom. I mean, some people, you know, died in prison waiting for freedom. And I'm sure people like, you know, for instance, Nelson Mandela probably saw many of his compatriots die waiting for freedom, you know, or another other scenarios. But then there was somebody like Mandela who was released and did see that freedom, that reconciliation of different peoples in South Africa. So that's an example. And there's certainly other examples from history, but sometimes it takes that generation of waiting to get to that generation of liberation or, or freedom. Um, you know, there has to be that period, you know, unfortunately. But Lord takes care of those people, even if they suffer on the earth. There's a, they receive the crown of righteousness later. You know, they're part of, we're part of a link in a chain, um, especially in terms of salvation history. How many of us, of us think of history in terms of what God desires to do for the salvation of the earth? You know, sometimes we can study history in school and separate it from you know, the, the history we read about in the Bible. And in fact, they're linked. You know, there's parts of history around the world that aren't necessarily in here, but they are contiguous and linked together. God is the God of all nations. He's the God of the whole universe. And so, you know, salvation history is, uh, is a part of the story and a part of God's desire for the world. So what I, you know, tell young people or youth when I used to teach youth is that, we have this part between Pentecost and the second coming, and that's our story. That's what we're filling in right now. And whatever we're filling in right now, no matter what we're going through, the end has already been written, and it's a hopeful ending. So you give God a chance, you know, you will see that good ending. The ending does end good for those who wait upon the Lord, who is righteous. It just may not come in their particular mortal lifetime, but certainly um, from the perspective of eternity, from the perspective of resurrection, it does, it does come. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's one thing that I wonder about with these prophets is, for the exception of Ezekiel, and, you know, you see some hints of renewal, of resurrection, but they didn't have that same hope of the resurrection that we do or that we know and that we're guaranteed. Um, one can only wonder how they um, dealt with it or understood it, that faith before, you know, the resurrection happened. They had this concept of shield. We're going down to shield, the place of the dead. And they had this concept in the, in the far reaches that God would renew his kingdom. But they didn't necessarily have this revelation that we do, that, we be, that we're blessed from of resurrection. You know, I wouldn't, I don't know what it would be like to live in a time where we didn't fully understand resurrection, but I'm glad I don't live there, <laughs> you know. Um, you know, and yet there was a closeness, the advantage they have is there was a, probably a closeness to God they experienced that we don't quite experience, you know, um, um, in the temple, you know, seeing the presence of, or the fire of God, I mean. We don't get that benefit. So there's a pros and cons, I, I think, too. Well, they were closer to the mountaintop where Abraham was told to go sacrifice his son. Yeah. 
they gave him something else to sacrifice. But yes. So they were closer to that than we are. Right. So some miracles, but we're closer to the ultimate miracle, which is resurrection, you know. I think each one in its own way has its own difficulty because it requires strong faith to take and believe your God back then. We didn't know what was beyond. We just knew he had a great and powerful God and saw what he did. Right. We can believe in it. Now I think we can place it. We see it, but it's not happening right now. We see all these things. And I think we fall into the opposite. We've got too much to see. Mm -hmm. And we don't focus on the God. We focus on all the other things along the way. Um, so in a, its own way, I think they require a strong faith. And it's harder for us to get to the point. Right. Bruce, have a good choir. Yeah. If that makes any sense. May, it, do, it does. It does. It, it's sometimes harder. We have more... That gets in our way, I think. Yeah, the more material things, distractions. Um, let's go ahead and head to Zephaniah. And then we also want to touch upon Haggai as well. Um, the word of the Lord that came to Zephaniah, son of Cushi, son of Gedaliah, son of Amariah, son of Hezekiah, in the days of King Josiah, a son of Ammon of Judah. I will utterly sweep away everything from the face of the earth, says the Lord. I will sweep away humans and animals. I will sweep away the birds of the air and the fish of the sea. I will make the wicked stumble. I will cut off humanity from the face of the earth, says the Lord. I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And I will cut off from this place every remnant of Baal. In the name of the idolatrous priests, those who bow down on the roofs to the host of heaven, those who bow down and swear to the Lord, but also swear by Milcom. Those who have turned back from following the Lord, who have not sought the Lord or inquired of him. Be silent before the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice, and he has consecrated his guests. And on the day of the Lord's sacrifice, I will pit, punish the officials and the king's sons and all who dress themselves in foreign attire. On that day, I will punish all who leap over the threshold, who fill the master's house with violence and fraud. On that day, says the Lord, a cry will be heard from the fish gate, a wail from the second quarter, a loud crash from the hills, the inhabitants of the mortar wail, for all the traders that perish, all who weigh out silver are cut off. And at that time, I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish the people who rest completely on their dregs, and who say in their hearts, the Lord will do, not do good, nor will he do harm. Their wells shall be plundered and their houses laid waste. Though they build houses, they shall not inhabit them. Though they plant vineyards, they shall not drink wine from them. So the judgment will come to Jerusalem. As I was talking about, you know, the city state, you know, has kind of come to one place and that's it, Jerusalem. And Jerusalem hanging on by a thread, but Jerusalem's going to be gone soon too. The great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The warrior cried aloud there. The day will be a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet blast and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the lofty battlements. Uh, so let's go ahead and go to chapter three verses, and we're going to do verses eight, um, and finish out here. So So therefore, wait for me, says the Lord, for the day when I arise as a witness, for my decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour out them upon my indignation, all the heat of my anger, and for... In the fire of my passion, all the earth shall be consumed. At that time, I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech, that all of them may call on the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my suppliants, my scattered ones, shall bring my offering. Okay, so this is an undoing of a couple things. Of one, diaspora, of 
the dispersion of people, of spreading apart of people, which even before the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, you can see in you know, the Gospels and the Acts of the Apostles, the Jewish people have already been spread out to different parts of the Roman Empire, some for economic necessity, but some for various conquests that have happened, um, events that have happened. And then um, also an undoing of, you know, the Tower of Babel. What, if you remember the story of the Tower of Babel in Genesis, people can understand each other. They speak a common language. They can work together. And the Lord is saying that there's going to be a day where this is going to, this kind of understanding and cooperation is going to return. What do you think this prophecy is about? And at that time, I will change the speech of my people to a spear speech. And all of them may call in the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord. Where is it that they, uh, in the New Testament, in it, that they come to understand each other? Pentecost. Pentecost, exactly. Yeah, preacher's looking for an answer. The day of Pentecost is the undoing of Babel. So there's a reverence to Babel and then the undoing of that. People will have a common speech. If they, if the spirit lives within them, there will be a common understanding. And um, I, I've seen this at work that, you know, especially if you go to places in mission and you, you know, come to worship at other places where they're worshiping other languages, there's a hard to explain commonality and spirit that binds us as as people of faith who believe in Jesus Christ. That, you know, there's something that links us together and there's an understanding. Now, we can speak about spirit language, is there glossolalia? And if you have glossolalia, should there be somebody to interpret it? And I'm not going to go into that part of the lesson there specifically. Um, though I think that there is, a, you know, spirit language, absolutely. People do speak in tongues. They do have that gift. And then there's the gift of interpretation. And it is it is a modern day prophetic act. Usually the church needs to hear something that somebody's saying. Um, but too often what happens among those who really focus on that is that they put pressure, I think, on people to have that gift when not everybody's going to receive that gift. And they put it as a condition of, well, are you really sanctified? Are you really blessed? If so, you're going to speak in tongues. So not, that's not what we're dealing with when we're dealing with what the spirit is doing the spirit desires to bring people to god's people together um you know how pleasant it is when brothers and sisters dwell together in unity when the brothers dwell together in unity it says it in the psalm psalm um you know 122 so um and then so on this day of pentecost once again it says in verse 11 on that day you shall not be put to shame because of all the deeds by which you have rebelled against me for I will remove from your midst your proud, exultant ones, and you shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. For I will leave in the midst of you a hum people humble and lowly that shall seek refuge in the name of the Lord, the remnant of Israel. They shall do no wrong and utter no lies, nor shall a deceitful sung tongue be found in their mouth. They, they will pasture and lie down, and no one shall make them afraid. So a couple of th things where this prophecy is fulfilled. This, this is the case where prophecy has different time conditions and perspectives. You know, you, you could use it to say, well, it's fulfilled here, it's fulfilled here, it's fulfilled here. So it's kind of complicated. But as I see it, um, you're talking about a time when they're uh, of Ezra and Nehemiah after, during the, the Persian Empire when they're allowed to return in the fourth century BC to, to rebuild the walls. And this is what is being you know, the reestablishment of what's known as the, the second temple. And there's a humility in there. So if you read Ezra and Nehemiah, you would understand the fulfillment of this prophecy. Um, and that would be after the time of Daniel, after the time of um, Ezekiel. Um, but then I think there's also a sense to where we need to realize that on the day of Pentecost, where did Pentecost occur? It occurred in Jerusalem. And it occurred near the Temple Mount. It occurred in the uh, upper room. So that it also fulfills that prophecy as well. So there's, you know, prophecy in the in the Hebrew scriptures can 
be fulfilled in multiple ways. And so we're not necessarily always meant to see it as one specific prediction of the future and to map it, but instead to see with where we look from the past, wow, the, these things are true in prophecy because they have come to pass. There are not too many, there are not that many scriptures in the Hebrew scriptures that are indicative of our future that is to come. Um, I, I, those of us after that, um, after the day of Pentecost, mo most of them have been proven to be true because they came to, they came to pass after the exile and in the time of Jesus, in the time of Christ, um, past the time of Christ and the time of the apostles. But after that, maybe not. But then there's a lot of, there's some debates about that. You know, can we map out a time in the Middle Ages where this happened or this or present time or that? But it's, it's much more difficult to try and line up a part of the Hebrew scriptures with um, the present day. So just kind of caveat there. Okay. Um, sing aloud, O daughter Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult. With all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem, the Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has turned away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall feel disaster no more. On that day, it will be said to Jerusalem, do not fear, O Zion. Do not your, let your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a warrior who gives victory. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will renew you in his love. He will exult over you with loud singing as on a day of festival. I will remove disaster from you so that you will not bear reproach for it. I will deal with your oppressors at that time. And I will uh, save the lame and gather the outcast. and will change their name, shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time, I will bring you home. At that time, when I gather you, for I will make you renowned in praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. <clears throat> so this restoration... Once again, simultaneously means the return after exile, and then also uh, the Messiah coming, the, the Lord Jesus Christ, as a fulfillment of that. You know, so uh, clearly the king will achieve victory in their midst. And who's that king going to be? Jesus. Yeah. You have any other thoughts, uh, Denman, on this? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Would ask you, these prophets, how did they live? Or were they were they accepted? Did people kill them? Were they exiled? How were they? Some of them were killed. Some of them were exiled. Okay. Um, we don't know the fates of all of them, but we have an uh, indication that overall they were, they had a very difficult fate. Yeah. You know, because Jesus laments the prophets. You know, when he says, "You Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets," and, you know, um, how I long to gather you into my arms. You know, um, as he weeps over Jerusalem and um, before his own demise. So he, you know, yeah. We don't want to hear that. So we have to shut you up. We will. Yeah. I mean, you think of it. Yeah. We don't we want this hard truth. Right. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, Haggai um, takes place in a time of exile during the in the rule of Persia. So this is a much later prophecy. This would be sometime in the 400s BC, or even in the the um, the, the early fourth century, and you know. 300 something, 380 something. In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, uh, the high priest. Thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. And the word of the Lord came by the prophet Haggai, saying, it is time, it is a time for you yourself to live in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins. Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider now you, how you have fared. You have sown much, 
and harvested little. You eat, but you have never, never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but have, but no one is warm. And you that earn wages earn wages to put them in bags of holes. Thus says the Lord, consider how you have fared. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. I think this is a great um, challenge. So this is a part of prophecy where there's not a condemnation as much as there is a challenge to the people. The Lord is challenging the people. And uh, there's sort of almost a sarcasm here. Uh, you know, God ha does have a sense of humor. And, you know, he's saying, you know, you who say there's never enough, go rebuild this house. You know, the time you'll never... If you're waiting for a good time to do it, there will never be a good time. You just need to go do it. Do it now. The time is now. Do it. There's a challenge to the people. Um, yeah. What's that? Still is. Still is, right? You know, we could be put off to, to tomorrow. There's never a good time, you know, right? Um, yeah. You have looked for so much, and lo, it came to little and when you brought it home i blew it away why says the lord of hosts because my house lies in ruins while all of you hurry off to your own house therefore the heavens above you have withheld the dew and the earth is withheld its produce and i've called for a drought on the land and the hills on the grain the new wine the oil on what was soil produces on human beings and animals and all their labors then zerubbabel uh, son of shealtiel and Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of the prophet Haggai, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message, saying, I am with you, at, says the Lord. And the Lord stirred up in the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. And the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the month and the sixth month. In the second year of King Darius, in the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the prophet Haggai, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, say, who is left among you who saw that this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Is it not in your sight as nothing? Yet now take courage, O Zerubbabel, says the Lord. Take courage, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Take courage, all you people of your land, says the Lord. Work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts, according to the promise that I made when you came out of Egypt. My spirit abides among you. Do not fear, for thus says the Lord of hosts. Once again, in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all the nations, so that the treasure of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with splendor, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The latter splendor of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give prosperity, says the Lord of hosts. Yeah. Wow. Um, so, so curious, we, we do have some folks who have experience in rebuilding a, uh, a sanctuary. So, uh, you know, does, it, does this prophecy, you know, have a ring to it? I mean, if <laughs> you were going through that uh, with people in Tiberias when the church burned down? To a certain extent, losing the Lord and the uh -huh. Right, the Esther, the time of this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But we were in another church that they had set aside a building for him to restore their hundred year old church. And it got to the point where they had started collecting money and they couldn't decide whether to. Raise the church and rebuild or to remodel. And because of it, there was a strong group that didn't want to raise and they stopped the process. And about 10, 15 years later, it came back and we happened to be there then. And it came to a vote that they said, Well, we don't want to get like we were last time where we stopped and didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. And they said they had a big covered dish on the, on the grounds. 
And they said, we will go on whatever he's decided this week. So they decided, and the whole thing that stopped was people that were afraid that the building would be torn down. Oh. But when the vote came down, the vote was to remodel. And they raised money and they got everything they needed except the original $3,000 that it said. Thank you. Okay. They got wow. $3,000 short because they never won one. So you can see what I was saying. Yeah. There was almost a prophetic word, like, hey, move on, yeah. You wouldn't trust me to take the lead. You, you yeah. Like, move on. Mm. Because it's all nothing to say. Mm. But they eventually did. And it's, it's interesting to see how God works in church with various things. Yeah, similar. What? Sorry, does you need anything? Oh, you're going home with them? Yeah. Okay, all right. Bye. hope it was fun. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I think so. It's trunk or treat. We had a little bit of a trunk or treat. So Kona Ice. Yeah, I don't know if they're still out or uh, after we're done. Um, yeah, and I I think God does. You know, the, as that's what I was really getting to, Doris, is that I have felt this in different places that I've been in churches. That this, you know, people don't think. Well, do how do prophets speak? Does it still happen in our day and age? And the Lord still speaks to us in, in various ways, you know, through the prophets of old, through the scriptures, but in a time of prayer, he will, he will speak to a, a group of people if they're open. And sometimes it'll be something that we don't want to hear. You know, I remember um, we were, I was at a church and they were wanting to close the preschool. The enrollment was down and they knew that if they kept running it, they were running a deficit and it could really hurt the church and hamper the church. So it was kind of a situation and then, you know, we shared in Holy Communion and we prayed and then somebody, I shared a letter, somebody wrote, said, you know, we need to give this a chance and we're just going to go on faith. And so we said, well, we're going to do it for three months and go out on faith. And uh, we have to close in the middle of the year in December. So be it, we'll do it. And that's when God really showed up and said, no, this is a preschool and it's a linchpin, I think, of, of that church, keeping it going, to be honest. Uh, in some ways, so you just never. It is hard. It is. It is. Yeah. Like I said, that church that, that said, "Well, we'll do whatever's decided that day." And that day, they raised all the money they needed in one day. Yeah. Uh, where they've been trying for years. Uh huh. When they were trying to direct God. Like, oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Exactly. So, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, to a degree, the same thing happened. It's various, but it's a situation can't go into it. Uh, the church remodeling and everything was going fine until there was a group that said, well, we need to do this. And then the money resources go down. And okay. So it's, it's, we can stop God's work. We can. The 24th day of the ninth month in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord uh, came by the prophet Haggai saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, ask the priest for ruling. If one carries consecrated meat in the fold of one's garment and with the fold touches bread or stew or wine or oil or any kind of food, does it not become holy? The priest answered, no. Then Haggai said, if one who is unclean by contact with a dead body touches any of these, does it become unclean? The priest answered, yes, it becomes unclean. Haggai then said, so it is with the people and with this nation before me, says the Lord. And so with every work of their hand and what they offer there is unclean. But now consider what will come to pass from this day on. Before a stone was placed upon a stone in the Lord's temple, how did you fare? When one came to a heap of 20 measures, there were but 10. When one came to the Winnevat to draw 50 measures, there were but 20. I struck you and all the produce of your toil with blight and mildew and hail, yet you did not return to me, says the Lord. Consider from this day on. From the 24th day of the ninth month, since the day the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider, is there any seed left in the barn? Do the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree still yield nothing? From this day on, I will bless you. So uh, there's some hint here that uh, somebody's got their hand in the cookie jar. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. First of all, thank you for saying what I was going to say next week. Anyways, <laughs> it's interesting. The first verse that Haggai says in the second year of Darius, 
in the sixth month. And the first verse of Zechariah says in the eighth month of the second year. Yeah. So there's only three or four months, yeah, going by. We just read a section that talked about the 24th. Day of the ninth month. Yeah, of the ninth month. And Zechariah says the same thing a couple months later. Which is a beautiful picture about God. Yes. You know, somebody may say something to you that you don't hear, but in a couple of weeks, somebody else is going to say it. And that time we'll hear it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, I think I think you got a great point because we don't often think of the prophets as solitary figures, but more often than not, they were in a company of prophets. They were in a prophetic guild, a group of people who worked together to try and bring about God's work. You know, we even get this hint that Elijah led a group of a company of prophets, you know, and then and Elisha was among them and Elijah carried the mantle. Um, so it's it's yeah, we tend to think of that and um no, it's a great example of scripture testifying to that fact. Yeah. And that we need, just like we need four gospels to tell us about Jesus, you know, one gospel wouldn't have done it. Um, we need some repetition. And one of the, one of the, say this, but a lot of the promises of God have that time. Yeah. We were even in the line of that time. Here we are 2,000 years later. They speak truly to us if we're willing to listen to them. Yeah. The same word, the same promise. But you still stand on it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you make a good point. That was contrasting to what I was saying about some of these having some specific, like, fulfillment, definitive fulfillment. But that doesn't mean that it still doesn't speak to us in our time. But I think what I'm discourages me is when there's some who make a living, like, saying, Oh, this means exactly this and map it out. You know, China's going to come over here. Russia's going to come over here. Like they're almost like playing risk and telling you how the world's going to be conquered in a day. And, you know, this is what's come to not. And yes, there are going to be time of peril, tribulation, bad things are going to happen. This is a constant cycle of human experience. But, you know, can we live with a perspective of uh, eternity with that sense of hope? Um, and yet, I, I think, you know, you pointed out correctly that here in the rebuilding the temple, there's a tremendous urgency. And some of that is good because it forces people to be creative and to do something in that, in that limited time that they have. If you set a goal for people and you challenge them, they can meet it. And that's what God is doing with his people here in this time to rebuild. <laughs> they waited all these years and they've had some opportunity on the Persian Empire. Persian Empire wasn't stopping them from building houses of worship as long as they paid tribute. It was on the people that their, their temple remnant didn't get, get rebuilt. Um, but they were challenged by the prophets with a vision that the Lord laid before them. Yeah. But we often don't realize that you said that the prophets were a guild. Yeah, that's, that's there right. Was a, sometimes a guild not seen. Yeah. God had a guild of sense. He had all of them. And we don't realize that's the way it is today. Those that are truly following and being his yeah. words to the world. There's going We're, to be a lot of ones that are in a false word, but they're yeah. still this same group that God's working. You might not see the one that's working 20 miles away or 600 miles away. They're saying the same thing. We're on the team, Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, I was told somebody the other day, I said, you know, so I was at an installation for a pastor in, in another denomination, and they were like, oh, okay, that's cool, you're Methodist. We're on the same team. And I said, exactly, we're on team Jesus. You know, that was acknowledgement. There's an, there's an acknowledgement. Um, and yes, there can be sort of uh, insider threat, so to speak. There can be uh, a, an undoing within the church. The enemy can, you know, do his best work, unfortunately, in the church, but he will not prevail. Well, yeah. like Paul yeah. would not, not Paul, not Jesus would not let the, not that one, but um, he would not let the demon testify. Yeah. The devil would use truth, but it comes from someone we don't trust, so we don't believe it. Right. So even the devil would use truth, and it's hard to will out. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. The, the truth, because they're making it, well, I don't want to believe that because they said it. Yeah, spool speaks the truth. That old trope. 
<clears throat> so uh, let's finish this out. And the word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai uh, on the 24th day of the month. Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I'm about to shake the heavens and the earth and to over." throw the thrones of kingdoms i'm about to destroy the strength of the kingdom of, of the nations and overthrow the chariots and their riders and the horses and their riders shall fall every one by the sword of a comrade on that day says the lord of hosts i will take you O Zerubbabel, my servant son of shealtiel says the lord and make you like a signet ring for i have chosen you says the lord of hosts once again this reminder similar uh to um what we read in Habakkuk about the kingdoms rising and falling. They don't, you know, we may think, oh, Persian Empire, there's no way that could ever collapse. Um, you know, so it's time and time again, you know, and, uh, you know, that's, we have to put our trust in God, you know. The United States may not always be number one. We all kind of have this, I think, really sense that regardless of our political persuasion that yeah, there's beginning to be emerging world powers in China and India and whoever else it's going to be behind them that is going to take on. So what does that mean for the future of a country? We don't know. We can worry about it, but we have to try and place our faith in God and trust in God. You know? That's one thing you point out in your prayer time. You don't just pray or for our area, or, yeah. or our missions, or if we are part of our state, but our country and the world. Yeah. And I think that's important to keep reminding us that when we're praying, we also need to pray for our leaders because the Bible says that. Yeah. And if we don't do that, then we're missing part of prayer that we really need to fill. Well, absolutely. And pointed out, and I appreciate oh, it. thank you. Yeah, and you know the other thing we pointed out in the prophets this evening, we had gone greater depth in Zephaniah. As you see, a you know the prophet is not just pointing out Israel or pointing out the wrongs of Israel, but the point is the pointing out the wrongs of other nations. And throughout the Hebrew Scriptures, there's always this Israel and the nations. And uh, even to this day, there's a kind of an understanding since we've been grafted into that tree of Israel. The nations represent, you know, is also a word for Gentiles, you know, um, Goyim. Goyim is the word for the nations, Israel and the nations. And how do Israel and the nations live and interact? It's a constant struggle for Israel, you know, and even Jesus acknowledges it, you know, for the new covenant people to be in the world, but, uh, you know, to be um, in the world, but not of the world. How do you, you know, be God's witness, keep your, let your light shine, you know, maintain salt and light, and yet not be, you know, sucked in, or lose your saltiness, or lose your light, um, and I think that uh, that faithfulness that, you know, we called upon somebody like Zerubbabel, who obviously has a tremendous amount of faith, the people who will be faithful uh, will be exalted and will be lifted up, so the most important thing if we can keep in these times like this, even in our laments and our questions, is uh, a sense of faith and trust in God. Amen. Amen. All righty.